Hey everyone, today we're doing a slightly different video where we're going to be visiting the ancient city of Jerusalem in virtual reality. It's a very cool program put together by BYU. And the reason we're doing so is because, well, this week is going to be Hanukkah. It does have historical ties, the celebration itself, um, to the reclamation of the Holy Temple here in the second century BC when uh, Jerusalem and the surrounding area was kind of taken over by the Seleucid Empire. Uh, and then there was a revolt by the Jews who tried to reclaim the temple where they were otherwise trying to kind of instill it with pagan uh, religion. And I think they wanted to put in, uh, make it a temple to Zeus and the, the Jews revolted uh, and reclaimed it. And that's kind of the foundation of Hanukkah. Fast forward to, you know, 70 AD and it's now the Romans who are taking the lands and the Jews who are revolting. And that is what prompts essentially the Great Jewish Revolt and the Siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So we did a series of videos on that in the past, which I highly recommend you check out. But I wanted to revisit that topic in the spirit of Hanukkah and in the spirit of me finding this awesome virtual reality tool. Uh, to just show you what it all looks like in first person, which I think really drives the history home. So let's, uh, let's dive into it. But before we get started, I wanted to thank Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this and many of our other videos in 2020. They've got your back when it comes to the dangers of the internet like surveillance, data mining, theft, and locked content. In addition to top-of-the-line industry offerings, Surfshark VPN's awesome features also include Multi-Hop, which lets you connect using two different servers for increased security, Whitelister, which allows apps or sites of your choosing to bypass the VPN for things like banking, Clean Web, which blocks malware, trackers, phishing, and ads. Kill Switch, which protects against accidental exposure if the server connection gets interrupted. And No Borders Mode, which maximizes your access in the most restrictive of regions. In addition, Surfshark VPN has very generous terms of use, with unlimited devices, 24-7 customer support, and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Try it today by clicking the link in the description below and using the promo code INVICTA to get 83% off, plus three extra months for free. So from this uh, tool, what you can do is you can go above and see the whole city, and then you can drop down and get different viewpoints. We'll be doing that shortly. I do want to set the stage real briefly about kind of the siege of Jerusalem itself. Um, so the city here you can see is going to be the city of Jerusalem. The older city is going to be the southern portion here, which has the upper city, which is more large building, palatial estates. This is for the upper classes. And then you have the lower city here, which is more for the poor. So these are the, the first set of kind of ancient dwellings with a single ring wall around it. So that's going to be the first wall uh, that comes around it. Then obviously as an old, old city, it expands. You have uh, another city here that pops up. This is the second city. It is then going to be blocked by a second set of walls. Um, and to its east is going to be the large scale Temple Mount. Uh, and then later, by the time you get to the Roman period, you have another city that crops up. This is called the New City that actually occupies this area, and it has a third set of walls. So when the Romans come to uh, to quash the Jewish revolt and a lot of the Jews are, are holed up in Jerusalem, they face a triple-walled city with a massive uh, complex here that doubles as a fortress. And so when the Romans arrive, they come in with the General Titus, and he has under his command about 60,000 troops split evenly into thirds. One third is going to be made up of four legions, then you have another third of auxiliaries, and then another third of local troops. For a total, as I said, 60k. And then inside you have Jewish defenders who total around, you know, 25,000, you know, proper troops. Uh, and some some zealots and other ad hoc forces, but the rest of it is going to be I don't know if it's a million but a huge population of just civilians who are uh, Crammed into the city uh, So that's the situation Rome then comes in and it's going to start to uh, its legions have a, a split approach and they come at the city from various different directions uh, one of the main legions the 10th legion actually makes its way down from the the northeast and is going to settle here on the Mount of Olives so I did want to go ahead and let's pop into the model here, and it's just beautiful. So you can see what it looks like for the Roman troops. Uh, so the terrain is a little bit exaggerated, but you do get a sense of kind of the rugged nature of this. So the Roman force, uh, this is going to be the 10th Legion, comes down the road here, and it makes its way over into this position and beholds, of course, the huge city of Jerusalem, massively intimidating with the huge fortress of the Temple Mount here. And uh, yes, you have the Kidron Valley right in this position, and this is very, very tough terrain. So in theory, you could get into the city by just going through a single wall, but it's a single wall plus really precipitous terrain, very hard terrain. And so the Romans are going to set up a camp actually here on the Mount of Olives, roughly in this position, overlooking the valley, 
um, but they're not really going to be able to push through this position initially. It's just going to be an initial fort as a display that they control this area, and at least to, uh, to secure the, the eastern flank of Jerusalem. Uh, famously, as they do so, and they're setting up their, their initial camp in the, uh, in the Kidron Valley on the Mount of Olives, um, in the middle of the legions setting up their, their camp, the Jews do a massive sally out. They come out of all of these gates, they swarm out across the Kidron Valley, and they fall upon the legions setting up the camp there. So one can imagine as a scout looking back, you know, you, you've said, okay, we've scouted the area, this is going to be a proper place for the camp, I'm going to go ahead and see what's going on. Things are quiet along the front, and all of a sudden you turn around and you see all the gates bursting forward with masses of enemy forces coming at you. Uh, and so they do come across, they're able to actually dislodge and drive back an entire Roman legion that was setting up camp. Uh, that is until Titus comes around with his cavalry, knocks that assault in the side with a charge of his, his bodyguard, disrupts them, rallies the Romans, uh, and there's a, a, a protracted battle back and forth across the Kidron Valley, and that's the first indication that the Jews are not going to go down without a fight. Uh, they are eventually repulsed, and the Romans set up the camp here, but this shows that they are not going to go down uh, easy. So we can go back to the top-down view. So the Romans set up a camp here, uh, but as I said and as you saw, an assault across that ravine is going to be very, very difficult. So what they do instead is they set up uh, on the western side, they deploy the three remaining legions. So you have the fifth legion setting up mostly around here. Uh, and then you have the final two legions uh, a little bit further to the north. And what they're going to do is they're going to start to set up a series of ramps. And they're going to assault the, um, well, I guess it's not here, but basically you should imagine uh, an outer circuit wall around the old city that is going to be around here. And they're going to assault the, the westernmost portion of this. It's kind of the least defended area of the whole city, stretched thin. They, uh, they are able to assault that with a series of ramps and, and battering rams. Uh, the Jews, uh, you know, counter sally. They're able to destroy some of the Roman siege equipment, but eventually the Romans do, do punch through. It was seemingly inevitable that that would happen. Uh, given just how you know sparse the defenders had to stretch themselves across that outermost wall. And so the Jews kind of give it up relatively easily after the Romans do breach the wall and they pull back into the inner circuits of the, the first and the second wall. The Romans push forward. They set up a camp inside of this old, uh, inside of the new city here in the outer circuit. Uh, and then they use from that position to try and assault the next ring of walls. And that's going to be in this position here. Let's go ahead and look at what this uh, this is like from the first person. So we're up in the Antonia Fortress, uh, and this is out looking at the rest of the city. So this is going to be, you know, the old quarters with the lower and upper city. This is going to be the second city here with its own set of walls. And then beyond that is the one that's not currently modeled, which is going to be the new city. And that's the one that the Romans initially breach. They set up their camp probably in the high ground there. And then they're going to go about and try and assault this set of walls. Um, it's said that they do find a gate here and breach it initially. Um, and the Jews are nowhere to be seen, so the Romans kind of push forward into this area. Um, but it turns out that this was intentional on the part of the Jewish defenders. Uh, a clever trap to let the Romans get in, and then all of a sudden, once they're strung out in the city, there's assaults from all sides, and they really tear the Romans apart. The Romans have a, a retreat out through the initial breach that they had, and they're pushed all the way back up to their camp. Uh, the next time they make an assault on this portion of the city, uh, they make sure that they create additional breaches in the wall, they tear down as many sections of the wall and towers, and it makes it so that the next assault is much more easily, has many more points of penetration, and the Jews, in response, go ahead and, and pull back to the next set of walls, which is going to be uh, the first wall, which is going to be here. Um, it would have actually been a, a full wall, so they, you know, Romans couldn't necessarily just walk under here. This was actually a completed wall. So that was highly defensible. Um, and then, of course, you know, the Romans might be able to push out against that wall if they wanted to, but you have this Antonia Fortress looking out and flanking the Roman position with artillery fire, with the ability to sally out um, and spot their movement. So this becomes the next kind of crux of a Roman assault is going to be to attempt to take out the Antonia Fortress, which is going to be a, a massive endeavor. Uh, so let's go ahead and pop out again, and there is a, a pretty good view of that. So let's go ahead and go to the Pool of Bethesda here, which is just outside. Um, so we're going to be at the corner here. And so again, to reorient yourself, this is the road that the Romans initially came down. They then kind of branched off and went along the uh, the eastern ridge. And that is the, you know, the Mount of Olives over there. And that's where they set up their camp. 
and they avoided assaulting the Antonia Fortress because, yes, look at this behemoth of a fortress, massive defenders all up here, uh, some artillery mounted on the walls, some uh, archers, etc. The artillery was actually seized by um, a previous assault on a Roman legion where they were able to seize their baggage train, and so you have a lot of like, scorpions and, and torsion equipment that it can rain down uh, fury upon the Romans. But in any case, the, the story we find ourselves in is this portion here would have been the new city that the Romans have now claimed. They kind of clear it out and they're going to start to launch an assault on the Antonia Fortress there. Doing so is incredibly tough. They, they set up a couple ramps to try and breach the wall itself. But meanwhile, as I said, all of these positions can pour on fire, have porticos uh, or other uh, portals to exit and, and sally out and assault the Romans. So it's very, very tough for them. Um, the going is so tough that uh, they're forced to, to, to actually set up you know, additional fortifications here and bombard this position. But it's still unyielding. Uh, and so eventually what's done is the ramps are built up, and that's the Roman procedure throughout the siege, is to build up ramps, bring in their battering uh, rams, and try and slowly knock a breach in the walls. And so that's what's being done. The Jews know that this is being done, and so what they actually do is they dig a counter tunnel from within the Temple Mount itself, or somewhere beyond. They dig under all of this, uh, and then they, have, they dig out a, a cavity under the siege ramps, set the pit props on fire, cause that cavity to collapse and with it they bring down Rome siege ramps and then on top of that they send out a sally uh, to burn all of those. So that's an incredible feat on the part of the Jews, uh, again showing their expertise in the defense and their, their tenacity there. And um, it's it's quite incredible. And to think that you know ancient humans could not only you know build structures of this magnitude but during the siege you have people literally burrowing underground for you know kilometers at a time uh, it's it's absolutely crazy uh, and meanwhile on top of that as the romans are doing this this siege on the antonia and they're being beaten back and there's that undermining operation that destroys their siege ramps similarly the romans have ramps against this wall they're trying to take the upper city um, those are then also sallied out against and, and destroyed so the Romans have to take a step back and reconsider their, their bullheadedness. Uh, and then what they decide to do is throw up a wall of circumvallation, which is going to be a massive encircling wall that the Romans build uh, to besiege the city even further. It's a complete circuit, so it goes around. It's about, I think it's like eight kilometers, um, studded by fortresses. And it actually does cut through uh, this northern part. It cuts through the, uh, the old, uh, sorry, the, the new city up here. And so with that encirclement complete, the Romans have kind of renewed vigor. Um, the noose is tightened on Jerusalem. They can no longer kind of sneak in and out uh, people, messages, supplies, and it really cements the fact that the Romans are committed to, to strangling the city in its entirety. Uh, and then with that, they renew their efforts on the Antonia Fortress. Luckily for the Romans, what ends up happening is that the Antonia here, the mine that came from perhaps inside of the uh, the Temple Mount or perhaps from another position, the mine that they, they dug that countermined or sorry, that, that undermined uh, the Roman siege ramps that made its way out here. Uh, in the middle of the night, actually, um, yet more of the excavations kind of buckle. And instead of just taking out, you know, the siege ramps, which they already did, it now buckles and collapses this portion of the wall. So what you have is in the middle of the night, this wall of the Antonia Fortress that the Romans have been desperately trying to break into uh, now collapses. And what that opens up is the entire courtyard here. Uh, and so at, at dawn, Titus rallies some of the best troops that he can, or at least asks for volunteers and says, who will charge into the breach? Which, based off what the Romans have seen as a suicide mission to charge into the teeth of the Jewish defense, and just consider what that would have looked like as a Jewish defender to see Romans trying to pour through that gap. You have complete surrounding arcs of fire on that. That's, that's clearly suicidal and the Romans would have known it. So anyways, they, they send a party forward heavy casualties and they're thrown back by the Jews and the Romans kind of sit back and wait um, and there's there's a bit of a stalemate it's uh, it's a supposedly I think during these stalemates that you have like a, a Jewish champion and it might have been earlier who basically stands at one of these breaches in the walls uh, and dares the Romans to come at him and challenges him a couple of Romans come forward and are slain until eventually a Roman centurion actually draws a bow fires upon him and takes the champion down so you have all kinds of these little minutiae in the stories and you can just imagine as a as a, as a Jewish observer in the tower, watching your champion there, challenging, slaying Romans. 
you're cheering him on. There's a whole, you know, a whole crowd behind him cheering him on, and then eventually you see an arrow come out of nowhere and knock him, uh, knock him down. And uh, you can imagine the profanities hurled at the Romans in the distance. You can actually visually see, uh, and that's why I love this 3D model, is you can imagine all these scenes uh, in your mind's eye. Um, but anyways, back to the story. So there's the breach in the wall. The Romans send the volunteers. The volunteers are pushed back, and there's a bit of a stalemate. Uh, but then eventually, one night, there's um, some Romans who kind of rally themselves, and this is completely organic. Just a, a group cobbles itself together and decides to do a, a night assault. Uh, and it's completely, you know, un uncoordinated. But nonetheless, they're able to sneak past some of the Jewish defenders, they kill some of them, and at night, they kind of crawl across the rubble, make it into this courtyard, and they, um, the Roman trumpeter who comes with them blares out siren horns. And so you can imagine one of the Jewish guards or other garrison members who are sleeping all of a sudden hear a Roman horn reverberating from within the courtyard. This causes absolute chaos and panic. Uh, this guard in the tower here, for instance, might think that, oh my goodness, you know, I'm stuck up here. The Romans are inside. He's going to be running down the stairs to try and escape. Everyone from this, this garrison position then pours out and tries to leave the position in the chaos. They then storm out across the courtyard and, and try and make their way back to the remaining garrisons up here. But they quickly see that no one's pursuing them, and so they rally their forces and come back. Uh, and, and there's a desperate fight when the Romans are similarly um, startled by the Roman horn that goes off. And so all of a sudden you have a panicked assault from both sides, seizing to... Uh, uh, to capitalize on this kind of serendipitous event and, and fight for the Antonia. And so there's a, a squabble, and this is all happening in the dead of the night, two armies clashing in these the confines of the columns and the passageways, uh, and it's just complete anarchy. And this goes on through apparently several hours until the sun rises, uh, and it just goes on for hours and hours and hours. Um, maybe a couple Roman parties do push out and, and go out here, but are repulsed. It's said that um, the Jews who had claimed some Roman gear in the process of the siege, who are now wearing it, that confuses the Romans. So the Romans don't know who they're fighting. They end up fighting their own troops in the dark passages. It's just complete chaos. And so the assault is, is eventually called off. Um, and so that's, that's kind of this first stage here for the Battle of the Antonia. Uh, later, the Romans do a bit more of a coordinated assault, and they, they further broaden the breach here. They take down some of the towers, and then finally they're able to push through uh, and take the Antonia. And then what they do is they, they push out, and they're able to, to kind of make it out into the courtyard, but the Jews are able to keep them at bay. Uh, and the Romans have, have issues making headway here because the Jews still control, you know, access to these further towers. The Romans might seize the, the courtyard down here, but what's going to end up happening is that this, uh, you know, this bridge here gets destroyed by the Jews, I believe, so that the Romans can't cross it. Uh, and so what you have is basically, okay, the remainder is still there, and that's an area that the Jews can use to, 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 to assault the Roman position. So the Romans find that they, they're not making headway yet again into the courtyard, and so what they decide to do is throw up some, uh, some, uh, some siege ramps, out against the the western side of this uh, this wall and so let's go ahead and maybe see if we can get a better view yeah so the Romans set up some siege ramps against this outer wall here repeated attempts and assaults and they they, they fail uh, at one point the uh, the Jews seem to uh, to vacate this position the Romans all of a sudden throw throw siege ladders up and climb over and they think that they've they've gotten an opportunity to storm the wall. Nope, it turns out it's again a Jewish trap. This entire place has been rigged up with um, with bitumen and, and, and hay and straw that they set alight on the, the underside of the rafters and the whole thing goes up in flames and the Romans are, are consumed in the flame. So every step of the way, the Romans are getting completely bloodied. Um, but at this point, uh, the Romans finally do kind of get a, a toehold in this position. And this is where the next stage of the battle for the Temple Mount begins is where you have the uh, the Romans setting up their armies across this uh, this grand plateau of the Temple Mount. And the Jews, meanwhile, have their main garrison kind of stationed along this uh, the, the temple, the second temple here, Herod's Temple. Uh, and again, it, it just provides convenient parapets from which to fire. And you get multiple battles out across the courtyard, uh, which is absolutely incredible. Yeah, the, the Court of the Gentiles, it's called. Uh, so what I wanted to do at this point is let's go ahead and um, go ahead and look at this in first person. They have a, an awesome 3D view, and so I'll, I'll let this load and we'll hop in and we'll be able to see what it looks like. 
And now we've dropped in and this is uh, an awesome on the ground 3D viewer where you can actually, you know, walk around and if you have virtual reality, you can actually do the walk yourself with VR glasses. It's very cool. Uh, but in any case, this gives us a view of what the perspective would have been like for the Roman commanders who who now hold the the, the pretty destroyed Antonia fortress. And you can uh, we are told, I think, that uh, Titus actually positions himself in one of those towers and is able to overlook this entire battlefield. And this is where the Roman legion, legions come out. Uh, and they, they, you know, they take some of the colonnade back here, they use some of it as cover, and this is where they station uh, the different cohorts and, and different forces out. Uh, and so you can imagine the ranks and ranks of Romans trying to set up and establish themselves here, but what they're looking at is yet another fortress staring them in the face with lines of Jewish forces, and they, they clash across this area in a, in a series of battles, and they're so intense that no one is really able to make any ground uh, we're even told, I mean, you can imagine, this is essentially like a Colosseum fighting, Romans fighting across a, a vast array of cobblestone. And, and what shocks me is that we're told that there's actually, um, Titus at one point takes his cavalry down here, presumably having them gone through the breach. And there's actually, I believe, cavalry charges, you know, back and forth across this cobblestone. Uh, this is really the height of the siege, and it just goes to show how intense this thing was. Uh, and again, check out our other videos where we go into this in, in more depth. Uh, but eventually the um, the Romans are able to push forward. One of their assaults does make it up against the uh, the, the the inner temple here. And uh, a pair of legionaries are said at some point to have been able to, to put themselves up against the wall here. Of course, the, the gates are going to be barred. Uh, but what they're able to do is I think they toss a, a, a torch over up through one of the open windows. Um, and it actually um, sets the inner temple alight. And that is going to cause a, a huge issue for the Jewish forces because now their main religious sanctuary is on fire. That causes a distraction, it causes chaos, uh, and the Romans are able to, uh, to punch forward. And so let's go ahead and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pan over and we'll see kind of what is on the inside of this temple that the Jews are fighting uh, so hard to defend. And we'll see what it would have looked like for the Romans to, uh, to penetrate within. So yeah, you can imagine if you're a Roman legionnaire making up to these walls, and, and what do you do? Perhaps you have a, a ladder and you try and breach this, or maybe you're hammering against this gate. So even if the Romans have victory, it's very hard to, to kind of crack this nut. Um, but I guess maybe there's Jewish forces during the siege over here who start to retreat. Some of them are trying to make it through the gate when the, uh, you know, the, the fire happens and everyone's panicking, and maybe this is the way that the Romans actually came through. Uh, and they would have been uh, greeted by an impressive sight. Uh, this is the main uh, courtyard here where, again, maybe a couple defenders are still fighting, but the Roman legions, perhaps, you know, a testudo forms in this gate and they push out. Meanwhile, there's enfilading fire from all sides, but it's at the same time, people people running about, fire is spreading in the inner courtyard there. And this is where the Romans are going to push. Um, and so maybe one legionnaire makes his way up through here, slays a couple of the Jews who are who are running away and trying to preserve some of what they have. Uh, and then they make it into the the inner sanctum here. I believe this is the court of the uh, of the priests, uh, and this is where you know a, a religious site, of course, for the uh, for the Jews. This is where you would have had some of the animals, you know, sacrificial animals chained up. Um, they they get killed ritualistically, and then they're offered up and burned here. Uh, and this is an outer site that is still quite holy, but the real holy of holies is in the inner sanctuary here, where you know very few people were allowed to come in, where it was actually believed to be the the full dwelling of, uh, of Yahweh of God himself and so very limited who could come in you make your way in here if you could and then there's even yet further um, a, a veil here protecting the uh, the the holy of holies the dome of the rock sits behind there and that's where it's believed I, I believe according to, to Jewish tradition that it's that rock from which uh, you know God formed the earth and it's upon that rock that a lot of biblical stories um, are based where, where different things happen. And uh, so anyways, the, the blasphemous Romans make their way inside and uh, they're able to, to, to completely ransack this area. They do, I believe, seize this menorah, um, carry it out, and this is the menorah that the Romans are later gonna, gonna parade at their triumph. And so they're completely destroying uh, this area um, and um, ransacking it. There's blood and, and burning bits everywhere. Uh, the, the Jews are, are still going to be fighting their siege, but are forced to kind of abandon this position. And what ends up happening is that I believe Titus um, brings in the legions for a brief uh, brief pause here. And they do a, a special thanks to the Roman gods and a, and a Roman sacrifice in this area, completely defiling the, uh, the Jewish religion. 
So that is, that's just the incredible, and, and seeing this in first person really drives home what this would have looked like. And now the Romans have taken the, uh, the Temple Mount. What they do next is they're going to go ahead and they're going to go and um, actually there's a, there's a bit of a, a lull in the fighting where the Jews regroup in the upper city here. The Romans have the Temple Mount and there's going to be some, some discussions. And the discussions apparently take place on this, this viaduct where the Romans have access to one side and they send out some, some, some messengers. Meanwhile, on the upper other side, you have the Jews who do send out some of their own uh, messengers and they have a, a consequential talk here as they're trying to exchange favors and perhaps talk about terms that perhaps some of the Jewish leaders could, uh, could get clemency or might be able to leave the area. But those talks pretty quickly uh, fall apart. And one can imagine, you know, I, again, just imagine there must have been someone standing on this tower watching these talks. And this is the view that they would have had, not just of, you know, the destruction of this area, the, the remnants of the, the siege works out here, the wall of circumvallation, but still the remainder of the city, which the Jewish defenders are, are currently, you know, further reinforcing. And it's just, it's stunning to imagine. Uh, but in any case, as the, um, as the, the talks on the viaduct fall apart, the Romans decide that they want to send a message, and so what they do is they send their legions out in the, the mostly undefended lower city here, densely packed. It's going to be some, you know, street-to-street -street fighting, but mostly it's just, it's going to be filled with just the, the civilians of Jerusalem who are in a, a current state of, of, of starving. Many of these buildings are, are filled with, um, you know, bodies who have died throughout the siege out of starvation and disease. But the Romans nonetheless break through and they set the whole thing alight and so smoke engulfs the city. And again, just imagine what that would have looked like for, for someone standing on the tower here watching the uh, the entire lower city burn. And, and similarly, you can imagine what it might have looked like here from the, uh, from the Jewish perspective as they still hold the upper city. Looking out at the Temple Mount here, um, you know, that thing has gone in flames. Clearly the Romans have taken it. You can see the wall of circumvallation out here preventing your escape. Uh, and then now you see the whole lower city uh, cast into flames. And it's just it's just absolutely shocking. Uh, and then finally, the Romans, after a couple of days, are going to regroup again. And they, they launch an assault on the, on the final last stand of the Jews here in the upper city. And again, there's another inner fortress here of, of uh, Herod's palace, I believe, with some tall towers. And so the Romans regroup. They, they set up a couple uh, siege ramps. One of them is going to be over by the gymnasium here in the center to try and get over this hill. They have another siege ramp by one of the towers down here, yet another one by the viaduct. So three separate towers. I believe those are going to be manned by the auxiliaries. Uh, meanwhile, the main Roman legions kind of exit the city, reform outside, and now are going to la uh, launch a massive uh, triple assault with, with various siege ramps up into Herod's palace. And, uh, and eventually they do breach the walls, and at this point the Jews are, are just completely exhausted, and the Romans kind of sweep through the city. Uh, and then after that, there's, there's essentially cleaning up operations to track down the remaining Jewish forces. Uh, some of the Jewish leaders actually went to ground. They went down in the sewers and tried to dig their way out, and there's all kinds of craziness that happens. Um, but that's essentially the, the gist of all of this. It's absolutely stunning uh, work done by the B BYU team and all the artists and the, the visual uh, work in the 3D model is just incredible. So I recommend uh, you check out this model itself and, and you explore it. Uh, I'll put the links in the description below. And then also for sure, definitely check out our other videos where we do um, the history of the siege and, and we highlight some of the, the key moments of the heroes on both sides. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Stay tuned for more and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.